Hi everybody, this is Josh with Josh Wright Piano TV. Today's episode is part of my Lessons for Beginners series, and this repertoire piece that we're going to be going over today is The Wild Horseman by Robert Schumann. It's a really fun little piece. We'll go ahead and sight read through this. So, it's a fun little piece, it's great for little kids, they find it exciting, and it's also a great piece for adults to start learning if you're having trouble with accuracy and being comfortable around the keyboard. There's a few things that I want to start off by going over, or I want to, I want to introduce to each of you first before we get into depth with uh, expression. So, the first thing is, how can we get comfortable with these moving hand positions, because you have to switch your hand position and switch your hand position. Now I've presented this in a video before, but a very effective technique is to play these hand positions blocked. So determine where you have to move your hand. Uh, I'll help you with this first one. Right there is where the thumb switches, okay? So we will do all of the notes. We'll just block that. Okay, now this next one. Let's go back and try those two hand positions again. That covers the first two measures. That's pretty cool. Next one. Okay, and then the next measure. You don't really have to move your hand, but I'd probably suggest blocking it uh, anyways. So I'm just going to play the first measure. Halfway through the first measure, into the end of the second measure, third measure fourth measure. Okay, now that might seem like nonsense to a lot of you, but now you have the basic hand positions, now you just have to pluck out the, the notes. Okay, pretty basic stuff. Okay, same thing in the left hand down here. Okay, so I'm just going to put this blocking that. So I just have a, a, a solid hand position for each position, um, for each measure. Okay, that's how I'd go about learning it. A couple of suggestions so far as technique with this to get your staccatos extra crisp. I want you each to try something. Um, this is called uh, finger staccato. So watch my wrist here as I play through this. Okay, so. It's not locked, I'm not doing this, but I'm also not bouncing on every staccato. I find that wrist staccato is helpful for me when I need to stay loose, like something like the Liszt Rhapsody number no. 6. This, on the other hand, is much more efficient if you use finger staccato, so just pluck the finger back a little bit, maybe like one centimeter. Let's actually zoom in here and get a, a little closer angle so everyone can see this. Okay, here we go. Notice I'm not using wrist for every single one of them. I'm just plucking with my finger. Same thing in the left hand chords. Just grab those. Okay, and then when I put it together. Ok, 
Okay, so remember, just kind of pull back off the keys, but you just need a little bit of this kind of motion right here. You don't need to pluck way crazy like that. All right, let's move on. The next thing I want to discuss is where the melody resides in uh, throughout the piece. As many of you will see, this is obviously uh, at the beginning right hand melody. This isn't, this is just supporting material. That's not really important uh, melodic material. But if you go down to measure one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. That's where the left hand takes over. So you need to really work to get your right hand light at this point. Whenever you switch the melodic register where your melody is residing, you want to make it pretty clear. Okay, so bring that out a little bit more. One other thing that I wanted to explain to each of you, when you see a sforzando, that little SF written in, usually that can mean some type of emphasis or accent. Whenever you see a sforzando though, always do it within the dynamic range that you're in. If you're playing pianissimo and you see a sforzando, that sforzando might only be piano or mezzo piano. You know, it's emphasis within the dynamic range. That's true of accents as well. One thing I want each of you to realize is in Chopin's music, this is a little gem of wisdom thrown into this Lesson for Beginners series here, accents in Chopin don't usually mean play it louder. They generally mean take a little bit of time or express it differently. So even with sforzandos, even though I do think that's more of a volume issue, you can also think a little bit of emphasis there as well. So you don't have to do... a little rigid and vertical. I don't like that as much as this. See, I just lean. I'm taking like a couple milliseconds extra time right there. And that gives it just enough along with the tiny emphasis in dynamic increase. That will help a lot. Now, in my edition, which I don't know if this is a good edition or not, um, I don't have like the sophisticated editions for my beginning repertoire, but I have a mezzo forte marked. Um, maybe Schumann didn't write that. I would have to consult with an Urtext edition in order to do that. But if you're going to start with mezzo forte, which I think is totally fine, that could be forte uh, on that sforzando there, especially when we're going to start shaping and that dynamic line makes more sense. Let's move on to uh, another concept in this. This will be the last thing I present today. Um, it's the concept of shaping in this. And we go back to a tried and true method of dynamics uh, according to direction, or what we call directional dynamics. So if I'm moving up the keyboard, I can crescendo, and as I come down, crescendo or diminuendo. Uh, it's not that you have to, on every single little directional change, make a big difference. You don't have to do, you know, craziness up and down. Look at the overall line. Same thing right here. I wouldn't do like that. It's overall going up, so I'm going to do an overall gradual crescendo. And this is, from this point to the end of that line, it's overall falling. Whenever we see two uh, passages that sound the exact same, but in different keys, that's kind of uh, a little mini sequence right there. A sequence is whenever you uh, repeat something over and over again. Autumn Leaves, famous jazz piece, is a perfect example of a sequence. If you want to do it to uh, to do a true sequence, you can keep going around the circle of this. Um, so whenever we see this, uh, I want you. Whenever you see a sequence, I want you to think, what direction is that sequence moving, and which one is this moving? Let me play it for you. It's moving. Uh, it's descending. It's moving from top to bottom. So we'll probably emphasize the top one a little bit here. Okay, and then another 
crescendo. Okay, now, here I will break the rule that I just taught you about directional dynamics in order to add variety. Since these are such similar phrases, Since those are so much the same, if the first time we end softer, the second time I want to end big. Okay, and then maybe a color change. Uh, in my edition it's marked forte, I don't know if that's the editor or if it's Schumann writing that. I don't think I would probably do forte. I think I'd probably do something like mezzo piano. Surely crescendo to there. Or you could do forte on the first part. Sorry. And then an echo. Or you could do a big crescendo diminuendo on one and then kind of stagnant. Uh, quality on the other, a little bit softer. You have so many different options and I don't want to spoon feed each of you this is exactly what to do because there is no one way to play music. That's the beauty of it. The thing that I want you to take away from this is there are several ways to do it and you get to decide. A lot of people think classical musicians are just kind of these rigid, um, kind of uh, unflexible uh, uh, people that we have to do things a certain way, that we're in a box and jazzers are kind of these free spirits that don't really have structure. Those are kind of um, from both sides of the spectrum. Classical musicians sometimes say, ah, jazzers, and jazzers say, ah, classical musicians. Both uh, arts have their um, uh, definite challenges, and there are several things about jazzers that I just respect so much that I could never do. Or, I mean, it would take me several years to be able to do what some of these jazzers do. And some of these jazzers, it would take them several years to do what we do as classical musicians. So, I want you to realize, though, we have elements of both jazz and classical music in both realms. And one of the elements that I like about jazz is the freedom with expression and the fact that you get to improvise a little bit. I'm not saying you improvise with notes, but always be improvising with your expression. Sometimes you want to play it loud, sometimes you want to play it soft. And if you practice it both ways in performance, it can be pretty spontaneous, which is really fun. I hope this video has been helpful. If any of you have questions or requests for this uh, Lessons for Beginners series, you'd like me to cover a piece that you're working on, send me an email. Uh, my email is josh at joshwrightpiano.com. Also, if you're interested in Skype lessons, um, I have several Skype students throughout the world that I teach. It's a lot of fun. Also, shoot me an email um, at the same email address. If you'd like to enter this month's giveaway, uh, every month I do a different giveaway. In June, it was a signed copy of my new album, My Favorite Things. In July, it'll be something else. Um, you can click on the link below that will go to my blog. Also, you can click links below to join me on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. Thank you so much for your support. I'll see you soon.